Our promised land is not found here on earth. Our promised land at the end of our sufferings when God deliver us is found in heaven. We will spend who knows how many days here, maybe one, maybe thousands. But I know at the end of my fight, when I walk to the end of my earthly battle, I will stand in eternity before my creator, my sustainer, and my savior, who is Christ. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Uh, for those of you who already forgot, my name is Bobby. I am one of the two interns here at Elevate. Um, I'd like to thank a bunch of people before I start it all. I'd like to thank you guys for being here while our youth pastor Cody's in Florida living a life of leisure. Um, he'll be back next week, so we will miss him but we are glad he's getting a well-deserved vacation. I'd like to thank Paul and Alyssa back there in the sound booth for being my chief troubleshooters leading up to this uh, little talk here. Um, Paul fixed so many problems for me, so I didn't have to worry about anything. I'd like to thank my parents um, just for providing me a Christian home where I could develop my own faith, uh, and be able to now do something like this, because I could not have done this without them raising me the way they did. I'd like to thank Becca for the interview earlier. Uh, I'd like to thank Bobby for also being a great sibling. Um, and I guess I should thank Cody for going to Florida so I can have this speaking opportunity. But more than anything, I'd like to very cliche thank God uh, for using someone who is definitely not adequate to be standing up here on stage and teaching you anything about him. I know a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the things to know about God. So anything good I say is his spirit working through me. Uh, anything wrong I say, I will very gladly take credit for because I'm imperfect, I promise you. Um, I'm a pretty simple person. I'm going to follow a pretty strict schedule on my notes here. I'm going to start recapping last week, then I'm going to read our text we'll be following today. I'm going to pray before I actually start looking into the text, then I'm going to walk through the text, and then I'm going to pray again in closing. So it's going to be pretty simple. Um, if you have the YouVersion app, uh, the notes from this are on there. Uh, Paul did that for me as well. Thanks again, Paul. Um, you can go to events in the YouVersion app, find Connection Christian Church, and my notes will be there for Elevate tonight. So I'm going to recap last week quickly. Week one, Cody talked to us about the first two chapters in Exodus. Actually started at the end of Genesis, but um, the nation of Israel was residing in Egypt due to the provision of Joseph, the son of Jacob. Uh, the second leading ruler in Egypt, who actually ended up in Egypt as a slave and eventually worked his way up. Um, while in Egypt, Israel increased greatly. They became a very large population and a nation that was not their own. This terrified Pharaoh, the head ruler of all the people of Egypt, so he subjected them to slavery. This did not work because Israel continued to grow. To stop this, Pharaoh commanded the Egyptian midwives to kill off all male babies that the Israelites bore. Pharaoh was not going to continue to let the Israelites grow, but the midwives thankfully didn't listen. Israel kept growing, so Pharaoh issued another command where the babies would be cast into the Nile upon being born. To avoid her baby being killed, Moses' mother hid him for the first three months being alive. Props to her for being able to hide a baby for three months. I have never had a child, but I heard they whine and cry a lot. I'm sure all you parents out there can attest. Eventually, she realized she couldn't hide him anymore, so she placed him in a basket and sat her at the side of the Nile River where he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter brought him into the Egyptian palace and eventually sent him to, coincidentally, or through God's sovereignty, through to Moses' own mother, 
uh, to be raised. Uh, when he grew up, he was brought into the Egyptian palace to be the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. So he was raised as an Egyptian, despite actually being an Israelite. And when he grew up even more, Moses murdered an Egyptian he saw beating one of his fellow Israelites. After this event, Moses fled from the nation of Egypt and wound up in a place called Midian. Um, he ended up marrying the daughter of the local priest Jethro. Do not use this as a reason to murder someone. Just because you murder someone does not mean you will flee somewhere else and find a significant other. Please do not get that from this text. Finally, the nation of Israel continued to be oppressed in the land of Egypt, but God heard their groaning, saw their oppression, and had a plan to deliver them. So uh, I'm going to move on to our text for tonight. Our text for tonight will be from Exodus 3, verses 1 through 14. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to open there. Uh, if you do not have your Bibles, the text will be up on the screen. You can read along as I read through the text. So it reads like this. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God, called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Will you join me in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for your words in Exodus, um, that they reveal who you are, uh, that they reveal that you are with us um, through the greatest trials and persecutions. Um, we thank you that you revealed yourself to Moses um, through many miracles, the one we're focusing on tonight being the burning bush. Um, I pray that all the words I say tonight may be glorifying to you and that this may not be about me, but that you may receive all the glory and that your name may be made great. Thank you, God, for guiding us in our daily Christian life and for allowing us to serve you despite our inadequacies. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. All right. So our series point to remind you from last week was that persecution produces purpose and power for the fight. I would like to hone in on one specific word there, and it is the word purpose. I think this text teaches really well through 
what I found to be the four events found here, uh, what our purpose is uh, as God's children. So the first of these four events is found in verses two to six here, and it is the burning bush. Um, In verse five, uh, we see that God is the one speaking from the burning bush, and that because God is there with Moses, that place is holy. Verse five reads like this. Then he said, do not come near, take off Take the sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So because God has arrived, Moses was standing on holy ground. And Moses has a huge problem with this. Moses is terrified and hides his face from God because Moses knows God is holy because God just announced it. But Moses also knows that he is a murderer and he is a coward. He is terrified. He knows he's unholy. And God's holiness necessitates our holiness. And that was Moses' big problem. Leviticus 11.44 reads, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. So because Moses was a murderer and a coward and ran from God to Midian instead of staying in Egypt where he belonged to serve God, Moses could not stand before God because he was an unholy man. But God provides a way because he is very gracious. And we become holy through our obedience to God. God makes it very simple here for Moses. He says, take your sandals off your feet. It's the only command God has here for Moses to obey that this is a holy ground he is standing on. Now, if you would allow me, I would like to stand on a soapbox for one minute. Um, uh, It has been, I have heard from a number of famous pastors, um, not any, Dennis isn't famous yet, our pastor here, uh, and I've never heard him say something like this, but I have heard from multiple well-known pastors that Jesus' death on the cross make the commands of the Old Testament irrelevant. Now, I'm not saying you all need to take your sandals off your feet, Right now, keep your shoes on, please. But the cross does not make obedience to God optional. The cross makes obedience to God possible. When you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for your sins, that does not negate that you need to obey God. When this happens, when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy Spirit then indwells in you and empowers you to obey the commands of God the Father. So God provides a way. We become holiness through our obedience to God, and that is only through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which empowers us to obey God. So I'm going to step off my soapbox and move on to the next event in this chapter. The next event I found is that God has empathy and a plan. So God says in verse 7, sees, hears, and knows the suffering of this people. It reads like this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. It may very well be that a number of you in the crowd right now are currently suffering, and that's okay. God sees that, he hears your cries for help, and he knows intimately what your sufferings are. He experienced all of them. Jesus came down to earth to experience those sufferings and to bear that weight for you. So God knows, and he has a plan. God responds to the sufferings of his people by promising deliverance. We see this in verse 8, which reads, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to that land, to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, for us... We are not going to that promised land. 
That was for Old Testament Israel to leave Egypt and go to a much better place where they would not be bound by slavery. Our promised land is not found here on earth. Our promised land at the end of our sufferings when God deliver us is found in heaven. We will spend who knows how many days here, maybe one, maybe thousands. But I know at the end of my fight, when I walk to the end of my earthly battle, I will stand in eternity before my creator, my sustainer, and my savior, who is Christ. So while Israel had the promise of deliverance into the promised land, which was the land of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, we have the promise of eternity, and that is our promised land as Christians. Finally, God kicks his plan into action, and he does this by calling Moses. In verse 10, God says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God's plan has begun. Please don't start singing the song. But the next event found in this chapter is that Moses feels inadequate to realize the calling that God puts on his life. And he's not completely wrong. But I would submit to you that Moses was more qualified than literally anyone else to do what God was calling to him to do. Why do I think Moses was adequate? Well, he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had connections. He knew the ruling family and he knew them well. He was raised with them. He was raised Egyptian. Not only does he know the people, he was the people. He knows their culture. He knows how they interact with each other. He knows how to connect with the people he needs to connect to, to get the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. And finally, he understood his identity as an Israelite. Moses only murdered someone because one of his fellow Israelites was being mistreated. Moses knew who he was, and that was what God was calling him to be. Moses was ridiculous, feeling inadequate here. He had so much preparation. But some of the feelings of inadequacy we might consider legitimate. Why Moses may have been inadequate, you ask? Well, in the next chapter of Exodus, we find out that Moses is slow of speech. He has a hard time talking, and he pleads with God, please send someone else. I won't be able to talk to Pharaoh. And if you want a stubborn and impatient ruler like Pharaoh to listen to you, you're going to have to be able to talk. So that scared Moses, and I'd be a little scared too. There was also the problem that Moses was a murderer in the land he was called to. But none of that really matters because this story is not about Moses. This story is about God. In verse 8, we see that God was always going to be the one delivering the Israelites. It says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. God has come down, not Moses. You are here to do this. I am here to do this, and I will do this through you, Moses. So Moses' qualifications or Moses' disqualifications are not important. Uh, There's a pretty popular cliche Christian saying that says, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I like to add one more sentence onto that and add that God is the qualifications for those who are called. It is God's work, and he might very well do it through us, but he does not have to. God is more than capable of doing whatever he wants with whoever he wants, however he wants. God is in control Not you, 
not me, not any human. God is sovereignly in control and his purposes will reach their ultimate end. Now, this also doesn't matter because by using a man who is inadequate, like Moses, like me standing up here speaking to you, like any of you who serve Christ, because we are inadequate for the job, God receives all the glory. I cannot take any of the credit. Moses could not take any of the credit. This was all about God and what he did because Moses knew he was inadequate. Moses may have had a lot of preparation, but ultimately he was inadequate. So all the glory goes to God and that is what God desires. He desires to receive glory through your life. So make it about him. Make him the chief actor and not yourselves. Finally, we respond to God's deliverance in service to him. Verse 12 reads this. I will be with you and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. So God does his work and we respond in service to him. That leads us to the last event of this chapter here, or at least this part of the chapter. I didn't cover the whole chapter because I didn't want to. I just like where I ended. It wasn't that I didn't like the rest of the chapter. I just found what I thought was a good spot to end. But the last part, event in this chapter is God revealing his identity. So first of all, to be sent by God, we must know who God is. Verse 13, Moses questions God. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses knows that if he does not know who God is, he cannot carry out God's calling on his life. We must know who God is before we do anything for him. If we do not know who God is, we will be sorely misled and we'll be working in our own power. And that is a very dangerous place to be. You do not want to be working in your own power apart from the power of your sovereign father. And then God reveals who he is. God says in verse 14, one of the most profound statements in the Bible, I am who I am. Now, what does this mean? This ultimately means that God will be who he is. He does not change in his perfections. What he is now, he has always been, and he will continue to be in the future. So we know that God is loving, he always has been loving, and he always will be loving. God is patient, he always has been patient, and he always will be compassion. God is kind, God is all-knowing, God is almighty, God is in control, he always has been, and he always will be. So this is not about us, this is not about what we can do, This is not about what Moses can do. This is about what God can do, what he promised to do, and ultimately what he will do. So the point of my lesson tonight is that our purpose is to serve God and to give him the glory for working through us despite our inadequacy. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that you are glorified through our service to you and that despite that we are weak creatures, uh, very bent on our own glorification, that ultimately all things glorify you and that you are in control of that. And we thank you that you are in control. God, let us not think too highly of ourselves. Let us know that you are so much greater. Your purposes are so much greater. And let us see that through this story in Exodus here, God. 
Um, help us to know more and more what it means that you are who you are and you always will be. Allow us to grow in our love for you and our submission to your commands, God. Let everything we do in life be to glorify you. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen.